Well, good morning, everybody. The reason why I am on the screen and not with you in person is because I tested positive on Friday for COVID. I am not feeling badly necessarily. I feel like I've got some post-nasal drip. I'm not going to go into any details there, but I wanted to make sure I got my sermon recorded uh, uh, in, in case my symptoms were to get uh worse. And uh, as it feels like right now, the more I talk, the more I, I feel like I'm, I risk the chance of losing my voice. So I'm going to go ahead and, and record my sermon now. Um, I want to say a couple things, though, uh, before, and I really do wish that I was with you um, to celebrate these things. Holy cow, way to go, Wilson, with uh, 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 crossing the finish line even before we got to the end of July for our capital campaign. Huge, huge shout out to you guys. We uh, you know, uh, with all things coming in, I think the, the, the number is 45,500, which is 5,500 more than we had intended. Thank you, everybody who contributed um, and sacrificed in the midst of that. Uh, we'll be able to fix the roof and, and uh, anyway, just fantastic and refill the coffers in terms of like uh, other large projects. Um, I also want to celebrate with you the announcement that's already been made. How awesome is it that we've got Indy back full time and that he's coming back to us and he's not only uh, interested and passionate, but called uh, and, uh, you, you know, to, to minister to our youth, our young people. And so we're going to start off this new uh, school year uh, uh, staffed, fully staffed and ready to minister to everybody in our midst. And so we've got a lot to celebrate. And so I'm excited about that. So. Let's start off with um, our sermon uh, titled today, which is the fundamentals of sex. And uh, we're finally going to talk. We're finally going to talk about sex. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to invite you to just, just bow your heads, please, and, and pray with me. Lord, as we look at such an intimate topic as this, as human sexuality, uh, sex itself, may uh, your spirit be present with us. Uh, may you speak to our hearts and speak to us uh, from your word what is indeed true and what it is that you long for us to understand and see uh, as truth from your word. May this conversation as we move forward in this series continue to be helpful to us, um, given its deep and at times even controversial sort of uh, nature that, that oftentimes results. Lord, we just want to be found Faithful. We just want to make sure that we are living uh, within the confines of your will. So speak to us and with all of this, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I guess what I want to do is I want to start with uh, the passage. By the way, there's not going to be a discussion group or a talkback group a a afterward. Um, we'll just, uh, the second week in August, I think it's the 14th, is it? Uh, we'll have our next one after that. I apologize for <clears throat> catching COVID. Anyway. The best place to start is to start with the passage that you've already heard read. Um, it starts with a viewpoint that's present within the city of Corinth with some that are in the church. Uh, it's a question that uh, obviously was written to Paul, and he refers to that in verse 1. Um, they're asking him various things, and he's already responded to one of those questions. And the first question was found, and we addressed this, I think it was in week 1, uh, what is it? that we are able to do. You know, what can we do? They are asking, the Corinthians are asking, this church that Paul planted and uh, launched and is now, you know, pastorally counseling them. They were asking originally, so, you know, uh, the stomach's made for food and the food for stomach, you know, the body's made for sex and therefore maybe we should be able to do whatever it is we want. Is that the case? And Paul says, no, it's not. It's not the case. We are not able to, or nor should we think of ourselves as um, able to do whatever it is that we want with our bodies for a number of different reasons. And I want to remind us of these reasons because they're foundation and fundamental, not only in our discussion today about sex and sexuality, but um, we need to get, get a hold of these in our head and our hearts for all sorts of reasons. And this will answer, I think, a lot of questions that people have along the way. Paul says, you're not, we cannot, we should not do whatever it is that, or think that we can do whatever it is that we want with our bodies. Because if for no other reason, when we come to God in Christ uh, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are incorporated into Christ's body. But even more intimate than that, more significant than that, is the notion that we are actually united with Christ in his death and his resurrection. We are united with Christ. And so Paul says, shall I then go seek out a prostitute? Heaven, heavens, no. I mean, there's no, that makes no sense. 
um, to, 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 to uh, use our bodies in that way when we are united with Christ. He goes on to say, not only are we united with Christ and we're members of Christ's body, these are both in and of themselves significant, but uh, we have also been raised with Christ. And we are no longer the same. We are new people, and therefore we, uh, uh, God longs to uh, um, uh, work with our appetites, our desires, and our affections, and to tune them, and to heal them, and to, uh, uh, to guide them and realign them. He also goes on to say, uh, asking the question in chapter 6, uh, can I do whatever I want with my body? He says, no, because we're now filled with God's presence. Uh, by way of his spirit, and we are now God's temple. And so if people want to see who God is uh, in, in any uh, ancient Near Eastern God or the pantheon of gods, they would go to the temple to figure out who this God was. He's saying, you are that temple. You've been filled with God, and so you need to be image bearers and reveal uh, um, who he truly is. And so therefore, no, don't do whatever you want with your body. And lastly, he says, you've been redeemed. You've been bought out of slavery. You've been bought at a price. And uh, therefore, uh, for all of these reasons, no. Now, there's the question in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, that asks this. Now, concerning the things about which you wrote, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Is it good for a man not to have sexual relations within the confines of marriage? So now he's uh, uh, dealing with another issue that's, that deals with bodies and what is appropriate within the confines of marriage. The viewpoint that Paul is getting ready to tackle here is the view that sexual relations, even inside the bounds of marriage, according to some, uh, ought to be avoided. And he's saying for all kinds of reasons, uh, no, they should not be, and so let me tackle this. In many ways, historically, uh, maybe you would agree with me that the church is, has been uh, sort of viewed as prudish, uh, doesn't want to talk about sex, doesn't know how to handle the conversations around and about sex. Um, that uh, sex is something dirty, that's sort of an oops or a whoops, that God didn't really ever think it through, or I don't know, um, uh, sort of prudish. Uh, you know, we discussed in the very beginning that to have such a view is to have a low view of the body um, and therefore have a low view of sex, uh, just as uh, having a promiscuous understanding uh, of, of sex and sexuality and, and uh, um, you know, human functioning is to have a low view of sex and a low view of the body. Uh, from a scriptural standpoint, Paul is saying, uh, and the aim of this particular sermon is to encourage all of us, after looking at several different passages, encourage all of us to have a high view of the body and therefore have a high view of sex and human sexuality. It's a good thing. And that's the first point that I want to make. And if you uh, have a pen or a pencil or whatever, I want, I want you to jot down some, there are five primary points. And the first one that I want to get to as we think about um, a scriptural view of sex and sexuality, it, it's this, that sex is good. And some of you are like, well, no kidding, Dave, it's, it's good. Yes, it's good, but I want, I'm want i going to surprise and maybe even disappoint uh, you in some ways as we turn to scripture and we really explore the depth and the meaning of what this means and why we should think and believe this. Sex is indeed good. So let's go back to Genesis once again. Uh, creation, this is a good pattern and a way for us to be thinking. It's an opportunity for me to help you uh, be discipled. So uh, around issues and, and questions that you might have, it's good to go back to creation. Let's go back to God's original intent um, and see what, uh, how it is that he created, why he created it the way he did, what might this mean so that we might understand what happened in the fall and what it is through redemption, creation, fall, redemption, what it is that God has restored uh, uh, through his son, through his work in his son, Jesus Christ. So Genesis chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 27 and 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Again, this is hugely important. He creates humanity, all of mankind, and he's done so through embodied or bodies, bodied, gendered uh, people. They're uh, uh, exceptional, they are unique, and at the same time, they are complementary. So both male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And it would be helpful at that point to jump forward to verse 31, where he concludes with, God saw all that he had made. It was very good. It was very good. And it was evening and it was morning, 
It was the next day. Some of this was already said in some of the sermons previously, but we are created to be image bearers of God. And part of being image bearers is to be embodied, one, bodies are important, and gendered, two, gender is important, and it's intentional, and it's intended. And part of uh, 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 being image bearers of God is for these two embodied and gendered uh, uh, gendered beings to come together in a particular way in relationship and with one another to reveal God in the world. It's a part of what it means to be image bearers and to have bodies and to, uh, to be sexual beings. God designed in a very specific and special way for uh, these two unique and complementary bodies to come together and as they do, function in a particular way. It should come as no surprise. Every single one of us, every one of you, is, a fu is uh, the result of a man and a woman coming together. We cannot argue that. It is, it is, uh, it is very, very obvious. Um, uh, and, and, but from a, from a scriptural standpoint, we must see that uh, all of this is good. It's intentional. It's a part of what it means to bear the image of God and help us understand how we might properly do that. And it happens within the confines of a covenanted relationship. Larry talked about this last week, that it's within the context of marriage that human sexuality has its proper place. And so um, this notion within this uh, passage, we see that there's a command that's also given by God to go and be fruitful and to multiply and to fill all of the earth. Now, the only way that this can happen is if what? These two distinct, unique, and complementary embodied and gendered individuals come together and, and, and they actually have sex to, to have uh, and to be fruitful and to create new and different human beings. It's certainly obvious, uh, this is certainly obvious, but humanity was designed for the specific act of these two genders coming together, not just for the sake of procreation. That would also be uh, to have a low view of sex and a low view of the human body. Um, it's far more than that, and we're going to get to that in our next point. But it is imperative that we understand this, and it helps us understand God's original intent and what it means to be image bearers. What's at risk is uh, a God being seen well and properly. It is good to have gendered sexual beings, and it's good that they come together in a covenant relationship and have sex. That's the first point. Sex is good. Second point is this. Sex is to be celebrated. I'm not sure if you know this, but there's an entire book uh, within the canon, within Scripture itself, that is uh, dedicated to just celebrating um, in a crude sort of, or, you know, kind of a distilling it down to its barest form, uh, celebrating romance, celebrating sex, celebrating physical intimacy. And it's the Song of Solomon. Perhaps you've read it. Uh, perhaps you know about it. In this book, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, uh, pregnancy and procreation are never mentioned, uh, not, not even once. What is talked about is the celebration of uh, deep, intimate, physical closeness, intimacy, the act of sex itself. Let me read to you uh, a particular passage to which you might say, uh-oh, uh, we're going to go there in church. I, I am, uh, because it's absolutely beautiful. It's to be celebrated, right? Sex is to be celebrated. It's something for us to appreciate in its proper context. It's straight from the Bible, people, and I promise you, back in the day, it would have been truly, truly, it would have been, uh, it, was, it was certainly good stuff, and I'm going to stop myself before I get into trouble. Um, Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist, artist's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pool of Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabin. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. I'm not sure Tracy would ever want me to say that to her. But your, your nose is, uh, is like the Tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. Do you see what he's doing here? This is, this is uh, the husband talking to his bride and, and sharing with him, with her, uh, the things that he appreciates and he sees. And he's describing, he's talking about every square inch of her body, her legs, her waist, 
and I'm going to just stop it right there. But he's, he's, he's describing everything right there. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of a palm, of a palm and your breasts are like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. This is, of course, the man talking about the woman and talking to the woman. Uh, but there are other th places where she is speaking to her man. And here's a passage. Here's a, uh, I don't think we have a slide for this, but let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than the best wine. The point here is that we have an entire book of the Bible where what is celebrated is physical, sexual love and intimacy. Uh, it's something that the Bible clearly declares as good and something that he wants his people to experience. It's not the ultimate thing, but it is something that he wants them to experience, and it's good. And it makes obvious that sex is not just for having children. It's not just for procreation. The Song of Solomon describes and celebrates in a classy way, in an honorable way, in an appropriate way, the role and the place of sex within the bounds of covenanted marriage and a complete dedication of one another to uh, these two, uh, you know, two people to one another. Too much is written today. Too much is uh, um, uh, produced today, whether it's TV, uh, series, you know, Netflix, whatever. That is, it's not classy. It's, it's crusty. It's, it's, in fact, cheap and crass and crude and obscene. There are things that are described like that. There are images that are uh, created like this. <coughs> Excuse me. I cough. Um, um, but, but it is anything but classy and appropriate. This is classy and appropriate. It's, it's beautiful, in fact. Uh, I remember uh, recently watching uh, this one show. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Comedians in Cars Getting coffee. It's got Jerry Seinfeld. He's the host. And he uh, calls up uh, various comedians and they jump in a car that he chooses. And it's supposed to be representative of their personality. And they go drive around and they just have a conversation. It's, I, just, I find it fascinating because you get like the behind the scenes, like two people, you know, two comedians being, being normal and, and uh, kind of uh, wrestling with one another, the way that they could kind of see the world and see everything. And, and on this particular um, uh, show, I think it was actually Bill Maher, interestingly enough. Uh, Bill Maher and Jerry Seinfeld uh, began to sort of lament how uh, that what is produced, whether it's on TV, sitcoms, movies, uh, what's written, it, that, that, that uh, sexual intimacy um, uh, has, sexual intimacy has been cheapened, and it's now uh, what's presented is a shallow depiction of what sex and sexuality was supposed to be about. These two uh, comedians, not theologians, these two comedians um, uh, lamented how far uh, our culture has drifted in its mores and how sex is, um, uh, been in, is being inappropriately handled. They don't use these exact words, but what I heard from these two successful comedians was a longing to go back to a time and to a place where intimacy was celebrated and cherished and where uh, it would once again be special and mysterious and, uh, and good and sacred even. So a practical application here in terms of sex to be celebrated is the way, I guess, the challenge that I would leave before you in terms of how is it that you're looking at or thinking about sex? Is it, is it, is, is it in a cheap, crass, crusty, you know, inappropriate way? Or are you uh, in agreement with, with God? I mean... And in, in, fa in fact, I would even challenge you to have conversations with those in your family, even your children, to talk about the appropriateness, the place, the appropriate place for uh, uh, sex to take place. And that it's, uh, it's not something gross or disgusting. It is actually something to be celebrated. It is good. It is to be celebrated. Se thirdly, um, sex deepens relationships. Let me go back to our 1 Corinthians 7 passage, uh, verses 2 through 4. Uh, but because of sexual immoralities, this is the reason why he's saying it's not good to withhold sexual encounters. Um, but because of sexual immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty for his wife. Likewise, the wife must also for, to her husband. Uh, verse 4, the wife does not have authority over 
her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband also does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. When two people come together for sex, and this is what I want you to hear in this passage, when two people come together for sex, it's, there's nothing casual about it. There is no such thing in Scripture as casual sex. Paul is saying there's something profound. There's something uh, the mysterious. There's something even sacred that takes place uh, in this intimate act. When you give yourself to one another, it is understood as giving your entire self to the other person. It is a giving uh, in its entirety of ourselves to the other person and the other person to us. And it's not like it works out in somebody's be, uh, you know, benefit. Paul makes that clear. Uh, uh, it's not you know, the male or the female uh, benefiting here. Both are encouraged to think about sex in this way. Both are encouraged to think about sex uh, as a total giving of oneself to the other. Thinking about it this way, sexual intimacy is thought to be so special, so distinctive, and so extraordinary that each time these married couples, remember within the context of marriage, each time these married couples come together, it is as if they are renewing their wedding vows. It's that profound. It's that serious. Each sexual encounter, then, is in a sense a renewing of our wedding vows, and why sex with another person, person for purely selfish reasons is absolutely inappropriate. Just as it's, 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 it's clearly inappropriate for us to you think that we can have sex with anybody and with as many people as we want, you know, outside the confounds of marriage. Um, it's, there's something special. There's something sacred. There's something uh, uh, incredibly important. And, and, and Paul, longing that uh, God's Spirit would, would work in these people, within the Corinthian people would, would come to a, uh, a healthy understanding, a scriptural understanding uh, and viewpoint of sex, that there's something huge, there's something important that's taking place here. So sex is good. Sex is to be celebrated. Sex deepens, obviously, relationships. It's a way to kind of uh, renew one's covenant vows. Um, fourthly, sex needs boundaries. All right. Now, in a few weeks, I sure hope it's just in a few weeks, um, the weather's here in Colorado is going to change. Uh, it's likely that it's going to cool down in September, and by the time we get into October, November, we might even be, you know, starting some fires to kind of warm our houses or whatever, um, you know, in the fall. Uh, but it's not likely that any of us is going to take any wood that we've chopped and bring it into the middle of our living room. Uh, erect a little TP sort of a thing or kindling and start the fire right there in the middle of the living room. Why is this? The reason why we don't do this is because fire is a very powerful thing. If you've lived through and if you've uh, been through what uh, many of us have gone through, the Waldo Canyon fire, the Black Forest fire, and other fires, we've seen them uh, almost every year since, that, that fire is a powerful thing. And there are appropriate places and contexts for fire to be, to be uh, contained and, and to be started. And uh, the, the most appropriate place for uh, a fire is within the fireplace. Powerful things like fire, and certainly sex is one of those things, is, uh, and des is designed and demands uh, that boundaries exist. And I guess that, uh, the point that I want to make here is that not just Christians and not just religious people I want to have, you know, set boundaries on things. We, we live in a culture, we live in a world that, that has all kinds of laws, right, that have been put in place. This is just sort of a, a thought experiment. We live in a time, uh, and I think it's, I just find it interesting. I, I find it interesting we've got two secular comedians who are lamenting uh, over uh, the cheapening of sex and longing for a day, you know, for us to get back to uh, making you know, where it's special. Uh, we have religious, secular, Christian, atheists. We have everybody coming together over the millennia and agreeing that, that sex in, in and of itself, there's something unique, peculiar, and, 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 and uh, special. And therefore, <clears throat> there need to be uh, boundaries that are put in place. Think of the laws that we have in place right now. We've got mutual consent that must take place between two people if it's going to be appropriate, labeled appropriate sex, Right? This is not the Christian worldview. This is the worldview. And just to point out to you that the world senses, as it should, uh, that, 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 that there's something unique and it needs uh, boundaries, uh, human sexuality. Um, we must not violate uh, the principle of monogamy uh, if that is what's promised or expecting. It's why cheating 
and uh, uh, infidelity is such a big deal. Everybody agrees, interestingly enough, whether implicitly or explicitly, that when a promise is made and something like cheating or adultery takes place, that it is out of bounds. It's bad. In fact, it might even be considered evil. I find this fascinating from a cultural standpoint. Our culture also recognizes the importance of not harming another person. You have to have mutual consent, and even within the bounds of certain kind of promises, there are still things that you are not able to do that might harm the other person. S uh, STDs, for instance. If you come down with AIDS and you don't tell your spouse and, and you have sex with her or him, uh, it, it, it is likely to be understood and uh, uh, determined that what you've done is, in fact, evil. Um, the act of sex, and, uh, it, it, so there, there are certain boundaries that, uh, th that our culture and our world have uh, also seen. On top of this, uh, there are laws that recognize that some at certain ages uh, are likely to be um, taken advantage of. Um, it's it's uh, pretty obvious that young people don't have, aren't, aren't, uh, aren't as wise as uh, they are at, at 40, 50, and 60, uh, you know, at, than, than they are at 10, 15, and 20 years old. And so that's the reason why we have laws that uh, protect the young and protect the vulnerable, the mentally handicapped and all that. All that to say is our broader culture has a clear, clearly understands and discerns as it should. And I think this is a, you know, an example of, of God working out his grace uh, in, in, in the world around us. Why is it? If we're, if we're just, you know, um, cells that have emerged and, you know, over time, we're just sacks of chemicals and we're the product of, you know, just merely evolution, then, then why do we even have these laws? I, I think it's compelling. I think it's an argument for God that we have these, uh, uh, these inclinations because they are God-given. Sex is profound. Sex is uh, uh, something that is important and must be protected and have and provide healthy boundaries. And even in this morning's passage, it's clear that within marriage, the sacred institution that it is, where the appropriate boundaries, it's, it's, it's within marriage that the appropriate boundaries exist. And within this context that they, uh, men and women are encouraged to uh, come together. Lastly, let me cover the last point here. Sex is not ultimate. This is actually a point uh, I just hope that you are able to latch on to how important this is. It's important for us to keep uh, things in perspective and not treat sex or even marriage or even our sexuality. Are you hearing me? Sex, marriage, sexuality is not, uh, they are not to be understood at, uh, as ultimate virtues. They are not to be understood as ultimates. Um, that somehow you are uh, perhaps less, and I'm bringing this up for a number of different reasons. Within the life of the church, I think it's important for us to understand that the most important, uh, um, or uh, I think it's appropriate for us to call into question the notion that the supreme expression of human love is one that's found in and through marriage. I think that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mess of representation. It's, it's, it's not a complete understanding. It's uh, the, the ultimate goal is not uh, a covenanted, married, sexual uh, relations with another person. It's not. And I'm going to discuss in just a, middle, a little bit uh, what, what, this, uh, what, this, what this is all about. The ancients didn't contend this. The ancients didn't assume <clears throat> um, that marriage was, was the ultimate. In fact, we've got passages that sort of challenge, that challenge this notion. Uh, Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, uh, where David is saying about Jonathan and his relationship with Jonathan as he grieves his loss, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. Now, we're not talking about homoerotic attraction here, as some uh, uh, often make the claim about David. Um, it's not that at all. It's just the, the very uh, clear awareness that... Um, uh, uh, the ultimate uh, 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 way to relate with one another is not necessarily through married sexual relations. That we can have deep, 
profound, in fact, the deepest and most profound relationships are not necessarily found in marriage. That may come as a surprise to some, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. But, but this is what the Bible is saying. Jesus himself says in Genesis, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, that there is no greater love than the sacrificial love that one friend offers up on behalf of another. And uh, speaking of Paul himself, uh, in what's considered to be the greatest discourse on love later on in this book, chapter 13, uh, perhaps a, uh, a passage that was read at your own wedding. What's interesting about this discourse on love is that Paul uh, is discussing this uh, discussion about agape love, uh, not in the context of marriage, but in the context of spiritual gifts which are being poured out inside the church, y'all the people of God, that they might be given special gifts so that they might love one another and encourage one another and build one another up and disciple one another and discover the love uh, of God through one another. When uh, a marriage is certainly a venue for expressing love, but w Scripture, when discussing marriage, usually turns to, and that's the reason why we looked at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, when talking about uh, 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 the love between a man and a woman in married relationships, it, it defaults to sacrificial love, the love that Christ uh, has for us as the groom coming for his bride to wash her with water and the word and to make her white as snow, wrinkle-free, spot-free, holy. He's saying this is the mystery. This is the image. So between a man and a woman, sacrificial love, yes, but if you want to get the real taste of understand, and understanding of what love is all about, you need to go to the church. Now what I'm about to say is going to surprise some, and some of you are not even going to agree with me, and I, I can understand that. Uh, um, but the, the greatest joy and experience that God has for us is not to be found in marriage or sex. That is completely countercultural to what the world is saying right now, isn't it? The, the greatest joys and experiences that God has for us are not to be found in marriage or even sex. They are to be found in God, in Him. The greatest joys and the greatest experiences are found first in a relationship with God. And then as we are impacted, transformed, renewed, made alive in Him, at the same time placed within his body and within Christ himself, raised to new life and brought together the greatest and most intimate relationships that God has in mind for us, interestingly enough, challengingly enough, are not found in married relationships. It's They are to be experienced within the life of the church as we respond to the agape love that God has poured out for us in Christ Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but uh, married relationships are, are to be experienced only on this side of eternity. Did you know that? For some of you, that might be kind of a, a new sort of thing. Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 30 says this, at the resurrection, Jesus is speaking, when God consummates all of history, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Rightly understood, the place that we are invited to find our deepest connection, our most loving connections, is not in married relationships, and certainly not ultimately married relationships. It's in God, in Christ, with one another, in the church. And this is going to become increasingly important as we talk about other things as we move forward in our conversation about human sexuality. The relationships that we have with one another within the body are meant to be like that between David and Jonathan deeply intimate, deeply committed, deeply devoted, where we know one another deeply and we offer and we sacrifice for one another. One another. Um, sex and marriage are not ultimate things. Neither is sexuality. But uh, with it, marriage and sex and even our sexuality are to be seen as sacred, solemn things that were never meant to be treated as ultimate things. Ultimate things lead us to a place where identity is shaped and emerges, and oftentimes where I, there's a tendency toward idolatry. The goal in life is not to, to get your friend married within the church. The goal in life is to know God, be loved by Him, be transformed by Him, be filled with His love, and share that with other people. And if that means they stay single, then they stay single. And if they get married, they get married. 
sexuality, the sexuality that we have and the sex that we uh, are, are um, uh, uh, that's made possible for us to enjoy within a covenant relationship are not supposed to be the ultimate things, and they're not meant to define us. Because the greatest relational and, uh, relationship and the, the most intense a relationship we could ever be a part of or hope to be a part of is one where God meets our deepest needs, loves us with the love that we are all longing to be loved with. Now, here's what's challenging, and this is where I'll just sort of wrap things up. The question of the day is this. Are you and I finding, because most of us, most of us are confused about what's most important or what's ultimate, there are very few of us who are, have it clear in our minds that the most important relation is the reason why when couples come to me, when people come to me, uh, the, one of the first questions, if not the first question I ask is, how is your relationship with God and Christ? Do you know? Have you, do you know the love of God? Do, have you experienced his saving grace? The most important thing is not this other person, ultimately. It is knowing God and being transformed, made new, filled, uh, 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 animated, uh, healed, brought alive, uh, and, and, and equipped now finally to love the way that God intends for us to love so that you can love that other person. He wants you to love this other person, but we can't do it outside of a relationship with him. We can't even understand love outside of a, uh, an understanding of who God is and how he created and what he longs for. We must seek him to understand what love is. Otherwise, we are loving in all sorts of directions and uh, uh, confused in all sorts of ways. The hope of a relationship with God in Christ is that we would discover a relationship so committed, so faithful, so intense, that it fills us up, meets our needs, uh, meets our longings, and equips us to love others the way that he has loved us. That is the ultimate. Through Scripture, we understand uh, that love is... Uh, uh, we, we can only understand love as we look to God. The one who created out of love and uh, began to give it all away. We are vice regents. That, that's the intention. We are to, uh, uh, to rule with him and oversee all of creation. And all that was messed up. And that's one of the things and through redemption that he's putting back together. He's putting us back together to image him in the world, to fill the world with image bearers, and to once again uh, appropriately uh, uh, rule and oversee all of creation with him. Sex is a part of this. Embodied, gendered, sexual, uh, 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 sexual beings as we are, sex is a part of this. Sex is good. Sex is to be celebrated. Sex is to be boundaried. But it is not to be ultimate. The only ultimate thing is our relationship with God in Christ. He invites us to discover for ourselves and encourage others to do the same and that we would become a body. Uh, of, of believers here that would encourage people first, pursue God. In a relationship with Jesus Christ under the power of the Holy Spirit, yield up to Him and His purposes and allow Him to remake and heal and reform you. That you would be uh, brought alive, uh, grown up, that we would become the people that He longs for us. So, within this context of sex and sexuality, uh, you know, sex is good. Sex is to be celebrated. It's not something icky. It's not a mistake. It's not something that got overlooked. It's very purposeful. It's very intentional. It's very important. And it's very, very beautiful. Let's pray. Lord, we, we give you thanks. We thank you for speaking to us even now, um, perhaps about some things that we haven't heard or haven't ever thought about, in ways that perhaps uh, you might even have challenged our perspectives and our understandings. Help us to see that the most important, the ultimate thing in the world for us is not uh, 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 that other people or someone would, would fill us up. They can't, we cannot, nobody can do that. Not even our spouse, but you can. And in uh, uh, recreating us and bringing us alive and, and, and filling us and equipping us, you make it possible for us to love our, our, our spouses and those in our midst, in relationship, in our churches and everywhere with the love that you have loved us with. And so we want to know more and more about this.
Help us to pursue you first. Help us to pursue you first as we get a handle on all these questions that come at us and we're bombarded with and the issues of the day. Let us keep one thing uh, uh, as the ultimate uh, and as our focus, and that being you, Lord Jesus. Help us. We give you thanks and we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.